In recent decades, millions of people have drifted away from Jesus and their Catholic faith. Sadly, many may never find their way back. I'm Tom Peterson, and I believe that God has called me to use my background in media to be a catalyst in the new evangelization. Our organization produces inspiring and creative evangelization messages that have helped lead hundreds of thousands of inactive Catholics, converts, agnostics, and atheists home to Jesus and His Holy Church. Join us as we travel across North America to bring you stories of heartbreak, redemption, and transformation as the Holy Spirit leads His people home. God has an extraordinary plan for each of our lives. He wants us to spend eternity in heaven with Him and bring as many people with us as possible. This is Catholics Come Home. Now, I welcome you to my home to hear their amazing stories. Welcome to Catholics Come Home. In this episode, we'll meet a man who grew up in West Orange, New Jersey, and was raised as a Baptist. While he married a Catholic woman and had a Catholic wedding, he vowed never to convert to Catholicism. But God had another plan in store for this man. Like everyone else in the series, today's guest came home to the church by responding to a call of the Holy Spirit. I'd like you to meet Deacon Dave Thomasberger. Deacon Dave, welcome home to the Catholic Church and welcome to our home. Well, thank you very much. Everybody loves to hear about childhood stories, where you grew up, what your family was like, maybe what your dad did for a living, brothers and sisters, and your faith background. So tell us about that. Well, I was born in um, 1955 in Chester, Pennsylvania. And a week later, I was moved to Hamilton Square, New Jersey, which is a small rural community outside of Trenton, where my father had just been installed as the Baptist minister Oh. He was an American Baptist minister in there. A preacher's kid, as they yeah, say. But I wasn't the typical preacher's kid. I was actually the goody two-shoes. Uh, I was the opposite of what you hear about preacher's kids. Yes. And um, basically grew up in the church. Um, nice. It was, it was my second home. I, I don't remember not being in the church. And we lived there for 11 years. And then my father, who had grown up in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, in the inner mm -hmm. city of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, was tired of the rural life. He wanted to do something. He wanted to promote um, racial equality and, and get rid of the, the racism that was going on. So he got got himself transferred up to uh, Orange, New Jersey, which is oh. right outside of Newark. Sure. He and would, he would uh, have some work up there. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. he did a lot of work. In fact, um, he passed a couple years ago, and they renamed the street that the original church that he went to. Joseph Thomas Berger Way. Oh, that's very nice. That's yeah. how much nice he, memorial. Yeah, yeah it was, it, he did a lot of work up there. But it was there that um, I started to understand who I was and where I related into the church. And I, and I knew that, that God wanted me for something. I had no idea what it was. Um, but I was also becoming disenchanted with some of the direction that the Baptist church was going in and some of the Protestant churches were Why? going. Why? I, I, I was having real problems with the fundamentalist movement in, inside the Baptist church. And how old were you when these thoughts started happening I, as a I, kid? I, I, I would say 16. Okay, teenage years. Yeah, right after I had actually joined the church, I started seeing and hearing things that I, I really didn't agree with. And yeah. I, I, I remember trying to read the Bible and saying to people, you know, you, you got to look about who it was being said to and why it was being said rather wow. than just quoting scripture. It's pretty astute for a teenager. Well, I, I mean, I just, there was an inside thing inside me. And I, I don't know what it was. And did your dad teach you about the faith at home as well? Oh yeah, we, t we talked constantly. Yeah, I, I would imagine. In fact, I can, I can still remember uh, in 1967 when, when we had moved up to, to West, West Orange that um, that's when God, the Jesus Christ Superstar came right. out. And the two of us sat there in the living room listening to Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh -huh. And I was just totally enthralled and amazed by it. Was your dad? Yeah, he was also. I'm kind of surprised as a Baptist minister, you would think he would be. Well, my, my father was cut from a different mold than, ah, yeah, than, yeah. than the average. I mean, probably why I was also. But yeah. um, Jesus Christ Superstar introduced me to the humanity of Jesus. Hmm. And if you've watched any of The Chosen recently, yeah. they, they're, they're picking up on that also. And, it, and it's, it, it made me start to understand 
the gospels more. That it, wow. that it wasn't this high and mighty thing that, you know, everybody had to be afraid of. There, there was a lot of humanity in, in the approach to it. Deacon Dave, a lot of guests on our show had kind of a checkered past, had a tough childhood, maybe drifted from God. Did that ever happen in your life? What happened in my life was I wasn't accepted at school oh. because I was a goody two shoes. Um, I had you a followed the rules, and I had a strange last name, and I wore white socks. Believe it or not, mm. um, so I gravitated towards the community at the church, and yeah. those were my friends. Sure, I mean yes, the, the kids that I grew up in the street with, they, they were fine, but yeah. My real youth group was, was my home as far as Which getting together with kids. Which is a good thing. Today's yeah, day and was. age, I, you, you would praise God that I, your kids I, I are thank, hanging around with church kids. Yeah. I thank God for it. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that was what it so was. So you kind of stayed on the straight and narrow. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I did. Yeah. And did you go to college? I didn't. Yeah. Um, what, what happened was I had um, come out of high school, and I hated school at that point, and I decided I wanted to be an actor. Oh. So I went to uh, HB Studios in New York City for two years. And uh, while I was there, a friend of mine who was uh, a student at Caldwell College, which was an all-girls Catholic college, mm -hmm. said that they were putting on a production of Oliver. And they needed guys to come in and play the, the male roles. So you volunteered to go to this all-girls Catholic. Yeah, I see the motive I, there. I did, I did. <laughs> and I had actually gone in there seriously with no intention of falling in love. I just fallen out of a relationship, I had no desire oh, to get- Oh, sure. No, seriously, <laughs> yeah. I, I had no desire to get back into it. And I did end up falling head over heels over the music director, ah. who was a student there. And um, she told me that she was never going to marry an actor. Ah. So much for acting. Because I really had fallen head over heels with her and I ended up, I ended up marrying her. Oh, you did, yes, wonderful. Yes, I did. She was a cradle Catholic and her father hated Protestants. Wow. So it, it, I can remember I would go to her house and to pick her up and I would turn the car off on the top of the hill. I had a Volkswagen Beetle and I would just coast down the, the road <laughs> and she would run out and get in the car and then we would just speed off because. So you weren't always a goody two shoes then. <laughs> well, I mean, she was worth it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she was worth it. You had a famous quote in your bio about becoming Catholic or not becoming Catholic, well, what was we, it? Yeah, when we had sort of made the agreement that we were gonna get married, I said, I will raise the kids Catholic, I will even attend a Catholic church, but they have to understand my faith also, and I will never, ever become Catholic. In just a minute, you'll learn what helped Deacon Dave come into the Catholic faith. She said, where is your faith? I always wondered if it was fake. And I'm starting to think it was. One year after I graduated Catholic High School, I eloped to Las Vegas, Nevada. My husband was not Catholic, and at the time, I didn't really think that it really mattered which church we went to because we all loved God and we all loved Jesus, and that was the start of my journey out of the Catholic Church, where I remained out of the Catholic Church for over 30 years. When I um, started to read the Bible, I could see that our Catholic faith is steeped in Scripture. I could see some of the sacraments in Scripture. I could see some of the liturgy in Scripture. I learned that the Catholic Church was started by Jesus Christ who gave the authority to Peter and it has continued in succession down to the present day. And that was the start of my journey home to the Catholic Church. If you've been away from the Catholic Church for whatever reason, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. Deacon Dave, so you told us about falling in love with your wife. You told us that she came from a devout Catholic family. And you said you'd raise the kids Catholic, but you swore you would never become Catholic. That's right. Because at that point, um, as I said, I was, had become disenchanted with where the Baptist church was going and, and all the Protestant denominations. So I sort of said, well, I can, I can practice my faith. I can go to a church as long as I don't belong to that church. I can still practice my faith. What's the logic there? Not committing? Not committing. Okay. Not committing to any dogma of any, yeah. of any yeah. organized. You'll worship, but you're gonna keep your 
I can keep cards, my distance yeah. from the politics of it and, yeah. and, all, and all that stuff. And I looked at the Catholic Church as being one large po political dogma at that, yeah. at that point. I was yeah. uneducated. Yeah. The truth be told, I was fascinated by the Mass. What fascinated you most when you went to the church for the, uh, for, to a Mass for the first time? The elegance, eloquence of it, the, the, the way... The rich the, tradition and history. The way the Eucharist was treated. The, it, was, it was just... Reverence, it, it, huh? Yeah. It, it, it just it struck me. As we should treat the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ himself. Yes. Yeah. There were a lot of things that I had seen that I was having troubles with. And I had a it was new to you, right? Yes, yeah. yes. And I had a conversation with the pastor of the church that I had been working. I was a musician in that church. Oh. And uh, he was asking me to become Catholic. And I said, not going to happen. <laughs> and he says, no, I re I'm serious. And I said, you don't want me to become Catholic. And I, he said, why? And I said, because I won't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> if I see something I don't like, I'm going to say it. He says, no, you missed my point. That's why I want you to become Mother Catholic. Mother Angelica would be proud of you. <laughs> It, it, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen there. Not yet. What, what happened was I had been working for uh, Panasonic for 11 years, and they had decided to move to California. Uh, and I didn't want to go to California. I'd been there. I didn't like it. Yeah. So I didn't want to go. Um, and so I took the severance pay, and I got a job with another company that transferred me down to Atlanta. The day after the moving truck left my new house, I got a phone call from my boss saying, come on into the office before you get on to CNN. Uh-oh. He says, you no longer have a job. Uh-oh. What was your life like then when you made the move? Young family, you have kids at the time? Yes, well, they were grown. I mean, I, my daughter had just graduated high school. My okay. son was in the Coast Guard at this okay. point. Okay, so here you're told you don't have a job anymore. What was that like for you? Uh, it was devastating. It was devastating because um, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't find anything that was gonna pay me the money that I needed to do it. And I can remember, it was some, sometime in late November or so, um, I, w I, had had, I was at my wit's end, and I pulled out my life insurance policy, and I walked down to my wife in the kitchen, and I hold, held it up and said, see, I'm worth more dead than alive. Yikes. Were you serious? I was serious. I, I had had it. And, you um, were that depressed? Yes. Yeah. I'm and sorry. She, she grabbed the insurance policy out of my hand, ripped it up in front of me, and said, not anymore. God bless her. And she said to me these words, and I'll never forget them. She said, where is your faith? Mm. I always wondered if it was fake. And I'm starting to think it was. Mm. And that, that afternoon, I, I went upstairs, and I laid down on the, um, the floor of our bedroom, and I just cried, and I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. If you want this to be fixed, you have to fix it. I've done all I can do. I went to bed that night and, and woke up, around three o'clock in the morning, I don't, can't tell you the exact time, but I sat bolt upright in bed because it had been revealed to me that the reason I was having problems was because I was trying to do it my way. Mm. You hadn't surrendered. I hadn't surrendered yet, but that night, I, that day I had, and he said, you have to stop being a Catholic or a Protestant in a Catholic church. Yeah. Either go to a Protestant church and be a Protestant and really practice your faith, or be a Catholic in a Catholic church. Right. But you gotta do something. Yeah. And um, so I sort of emotionally made the choice that I was gonna look at, at conversion. I hadn't made that, that choice yet. Right. But I had decided also that, that the center of my life had been my job. Yeah. And it couldn't be. The center of my life had to be God, right. which was surrounded by my family. And then everything else had to be a spoke off of that center hub. That center hub could never be touched. And a lot of us men often put our self-worth on our jobs, which right, we shouldn't exactly, do. Exactly, exactly. Our self-worth is as a child of God, not necessarily what ex we do for a living. Exactly. So to make a long story short, um, on September 10th of 2001, I had seen Father Frank McNamee at the church, and I had said to him, Father, I'm gonna go to the RCIA class. I've decided to become Catholic. Awesome. And the reason I say that it happened on September 10th, because we all know what happened on September, September 11th. 11th. Yeah. My conversion had nothing to do with that. My, <laughs> my conversion process happened prior to that. Yeah. When I came into the church in, at Easter of 2002, when they called my name, the hugest clap of thunder 
you have ever heard wow. sounded. Wow. And my wife jokingly said, that was my, her father fainting because <laughs> <laughs> I had become Catholic. <laughs> That following September, I went to a Casillo weekend. Ah, de Colores. And um, I felt that this was just the beginning. Yeah. But I didn't know what was going on. And eventually it came to my mind that the diaconate was something that I was being called to. Wow, and how long was this after your conversion? Oh, gosh. I, I would say it took another year for me to focus in but only a year after your conversion. Yeah, I mean, from, from coming in, it, it was yeah. it was like within a year or so that, uh, that so I- So you're uh, called into the act and it was fairly quick? Yeah, it, it really was. Wow. I mean, but I think, you know, truth be told, I think that call to the act and it was earlier. Yeah. But I had to go through all you, these you steps first. You were called first. to serve in some vocational capacity, as, even as a young person it, probably. It, exactly, yeah. exactly. And it just started to come to fruition. Now, the funny story about that was, there was an interview process in the diaconate formation where you have to stand in front, sit in front of all these these deacons and priests, and they have to, you know, the inquis inquisition basically. <laughs> and um, the head of it told me that this was going to be the shortest um, interview ever for the diaconate, and I and I knew why he was going to huh. say it because I had only been Catholic for three years at this point, ah. <laughs> and you needed to be Catholic for five. Ah. And he says, I don't even know why your pastor even sent you So they're you down ready here. to shoo you on, yeah, send yeah, you on were. your way. And, he, and I said, but you know, you, you don't know, know anything about me. You haven't talked to me. You haven't asked me one question. You're making this judgment based upon some kind of rule. Yeah. Why don't you ask me some questions? Well, as it turns out, it was the longest interview they had ever done. Good. <laughs> because they found out that um, I really was a practicing Catholic, although not in name. Yes. I had already, I had made my conversion a long Your time. Your heart was there a long time. A ago. long time before that. And so here I am. Um, I'm in my 11th year of. Thank you for serving. And, uh, and we thank your wife for supporting you. Yes, a yes. deacon knows. Oh yeah, yeah. That, I couldn't have done without, it without her. Without the wife supporting, could they not have be done there. it without yeah. her. So God bless and, you. And uh, my son is now uh, the head sound tech at the church. Nice. My daughter, my wife, and I—we are the some of the head musicians at the church. Wonderful. We sing at three masses every week. And you also are at uh, and I'm a, Catholic I'm a Queen school. Of, Queen of Angels Catholic School, where I was the choir director for. Uh, Gosh, I'm in my 17th year now. That was for 15 years. Then I became the technologist, and my wife came in, and she took care of the rest of the music. So God provided you not only employment, oh, yeah. but a vocation, because you surrendered and said yes to him when you were laying and crying on the floor. Yeah. You finally said, I can't do it my way. You gave up your male ego, and God jumped in and Absolutely. saved you in more than one Absolutely. way. Absolutely. In fact, I had to fill out a form, and they said, what was what was it, the thought process that got you to come to the Catholic school? And I said, it wasn't anything of mine. That was God. Because Father Frank told me to go over, apply for a job, which I knew I had no chance of getting, and I got it. And here I am 17 years later, still doing it. So. Next, you'll hear about Deacon Dave's vocation in service of our Lord and others. Because I finally realized, who was I to question something that's been around for 2,000 years? I mean, what do I know? Here, you'll find the best marriage counselor, greatest healer, wisest teacher, and closest friend. I need your mercy. I need a savior. Deacon Dave, we're thankful that you said yes to God when you were in such despair. We're also thankful that your wife supported you in your vocational calling to the diaconate. Now that you've been a deacon for so many years, what do you uh, know about the sacraments that you help to teach others? What fruit are you uh, sharing with those that you mentor as being a deacon? Well, one, one of the things that's been coming up quite regularly now is, is this whole bit with men losing their jobs and, and being lost. So I, I share my story with them to give them some hope that if, if you put God first, yeah. the answers will, will come. You, yes. you, you, can't, you can't do this on your own. It's not possible. I, I don't know how people function in scary times without faith. I don't, I don't know how they do it. The second thing is the, the words that have been on my lips for, for several years now is all we need is love. I mean, I, I, I love that Beatles song because yeah. I sing it all the time. Yeah. There is a lack of love in our, in our world right now. Yeah. 
Everyone's and, fighting with everybody. About everything. Yeah. yeah. And we, we need to stop. We need we need to start loving one, one another in a, in, a, in a Christian way. Well, and when you say Christian way, it doesn't mean we condone bad behavior. It doesn't right. mean we condone immoral behavior, but it means we love God and we love others, which is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is similar to the right. greatest as Jesus taught us. Yes. I mean, hate the sin, but love the sinner. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and, and stop being so picky about people. But that's easier said than done oh, and, because yeah, of oftentimes when we exemplify it, the person on the other side of the table doesn't always do it, which makes it a challenge. That's, yes. I, yeah. I understand that. Well, it's yeah. one of my challenges. Uh, so what do you see as a theme when you are helping to prepare people to become Catholic, when you're teaching classes, when you're uh, presiding over a baptism? Uh, what are you noticing these days that people really need? A better understanding of truth. Mm. What do you mean by that? Well, uh, there's a lot of stories that are out there about yeah. what, what Catholicism Misnomers, is. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what I try to help people is to see what the church is actually teaching. Yeah. And then when they say to me, I don't agree with that, I say, let's change our vocabulary there. Acknowledge you have a problem with it, but let's say, I don't understand it. Yeah. Being open-minded to learning. I, I want to understand yeah. it more yeah. before and, I make a decision. And you know, you were there too, so yes. you walked in yeah. their shoes. Because I finally realized, who was I to question something that's been around for 2,000 years? Yeah. I mean, what do and I this know? This isn't made up, it doesn't change. It's what Jesus gave yeah. us. He started the Catholic Church, it's the Bride of Christ, and uh, yeah. it hasn't changed. And the Catholic Church is huge. Yeah. Um, a good friend of mine gave me a good analogy. He said, the Catholic Church is like a football field. Most people play between the hash lines, hmm. but the people from the hash, left hash line out to the out of bounds, they're still Catholic. Yeah. And the people from the right hash bar to the out of bounds, they're still Catholic. Yeah. Just because you're in the middle doesn't mean they're not. And, yeah. and I look at that as, as a reality for myself all the time. But here's the beauty of it, because we talked about truth. We have the Bible, we have the catechism of the church, we have the authority of the church, which has not changed since That's Jesus. Right. So if you want to go to the playbook on that field, you look at the catechism and you say, okay, as long as we're on the field and we're, right. we're walking to that truth, it's all good. But when we go out of bounds and off the catechism, that's when we have to gently and lovingly correct and say, this is the truth. Yeah. So there is there is an out of bounds too. Oh, of course yeah. there. Of course there is. As as you know, through formation, we were encouraged as up and coming clergy to be in the center of the field so we could embrace both the left and the right. Yeah. And you don't mean that politically, but people no. people who have different opinions yes. or different right. different thought patterns. The, the hardest come from part is when you're when you're out on those fringes looking at the other side of the field and saying, Oh, wow, they're still Catholic, yeah. but, but they are. Yeah, and I think really what it's saying is as long as it's within Catholic teaching and as long as we're authentically Catholic, we need to uh, gently correct, gently share what the church teaches yes. in a loving way, yes. not in a pointing, condemning way. Right. And that's, that's what you've exactly. learned and shared. Exactly. Well, Deacon Dave, we're so thankful that you've uh, always had a strong faith background. And God bless your parents for instilling that in you. Yeah. Uh, we thank God that your heart was open and, and your dear wife was uh, patient with you in yeah. your conversion process. We pray for more of that. <laughs> Amen. Our wives uh, are very patient with us men. Um, and uh, we thank God that you're fully Catholic and sharing the faith as a deacon with your vocation. Yep. Welcome home. Well, thank you very much. Let's talk about the virtues. Practicing the virtues helps us grow in holiness, renew our culture, and become the saints that God created us to be. This week, we'll focus on the virtue of humility. Humility is illustrated with the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What a great promise to the humble. Christ tells them that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Like the beatitude says, humility is poverty of spirit. It helps us acknowledge our own defects and have a lowly opinion of ourselves, not to be confused with a low opinion of self. With this lowly disposition, we willingly submit ourselves to God and to others for God's sake. Humility tempers in us the disorderly desire for personal greatness and leads us to an orderly love of self out of appreciation for our role in life with respect to God and our neighbors. 
So yes, it's true, as Pope St. John Paul II said, we were made for greatness. But this greatness does not derive from self-importance. Our greatness comes from fulfilling the mission that God gave us by becoming the unique person He created each one of us to be. Now let's get practical. Here are three ways you can grow in humility. First, be quick to recognize others over yourself. Out of pride, we often want recognition for the things we do. One way to grow in humility is to give recognition to another, a friend, a coworker, a fellow ministry worker, sibling, instead of seeking recognition for something we ourselves have done or want recognition for. Secondly, thank God. Remember that the talents and gifts you have are given to you by Him. He has helped you achieve all those good things in your life, so make sure to thank Him when you are recognized for some achievement or given praise. Thank Him for your gifts and your positive traits. Thank Him for your talents. Give God the glory. Finally, be realistic. Practice being honest with yourself about your own strengths and weaknesses. When we grow in self-awareness, we grow in humility. I'll finish with the words of St. John of the Cross. To be taken with love for a soul, God does not look on its greatness, but the greatness of its humility. Here's your opportunity to grow in faith and help Jesus save souls. Visit our CatholicsComeHome.org website and click on the Shop tab. Here, you can discover our four brand new popular books to help you and those you love grow closer to Christ. The Willpower Advantage, Building Habits for Lasting Happiness, includes a personal spiritual audit and a customized plan to help you fight lifelong vices and find freedom in Christ. One Moment Can Change a Soul helps you guide family and friends home to the Catholic faith. Plus, two beautifully illustrated children's books to help your children or grandchildren stay close to Jesus. Epic, The Story of Jesus' Holy Catholic Church and Santa's Priority, Keeping Christ in Christmas. You can also order a car magnet to evangelize in traffic, evangelization cards, and DVDs with all of our best episodes of our international television series. If you have a question or want to tell us how Catholics Come Home has blessed someone you know, or you can financially help us blitz the secular airwaves with these powerful evangelicals, contact us at info at catholicscomehome.org or by mail. Catholics Come Home, P.O. Box 1802, Roswell, Georgia 30077. Please help Jesus save more souls. During his youth, Dave grew up in a Baptist family and vowed never to become Catholic. But God drew this lost son home to Jesus, into the Catholic Church, and ultimately to a vocation as a Catholic deacon serving God and others. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Catholics Come Home. Please keep Deacon Dave, his family and parish community, and all of us at Catholics Come Home in your prayers. Remember to fulfill your role in the new evangelization and help love somebody to heaven. I